22 is where we're at this morning. 2 Kings chapter 22. We're going to read the first two verses here in 2 Kings chapter 22. The Bible says Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Eight years old. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. This morning I want to talk on this subject, break the mold, break the mold. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time where we can look into your word. Would you give us just a blessed time together as we look at King Josiah and how he was able to break the mold. Would you be with each one of us here? May we open up our hearts and our minds to what you would have to say to us this morning. And would you get all the honor and all the glory in everything that's said and done this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A very poor, holy man, I put holy in quotes here, a very poor, holy man lived in a remote part of China. And every day before his time of meditation... In order to show his devotion to to his God, he would take a, a, a stick of butter, put it in a bowl, and he would place it on the windowsill before he had his time of meditation. Now, this was such a big deal because it was his way of sacrificing something for his meditation because there was such few there was such little food, such scarce food in this part of the world that he thought he was sacrificing something for his meditation time by putting butter on the windowsill. Well, one day he is meditating and he's out there and he is, he's in his, in his living room and he's meditating and he's got his butter there on the seal, on the windowsill. And his cat comes running up on the windowsill and starts licking up all his butter. And the cat just takes all his butter and he thinks, well, that's not going to work. I can't have a cat and sacrifice and have my butter over there, so I'm going to tie my cat up to the bedpost of my bed. So the next day, he goes for his meditation. He puts his butter there on the windowsill. He takes his cat, and he ties his cat to the bedpost of his bed. Well, this became a thing that he did every week, and he didn't seem to have any problem with his butter. His butter was there. It would melt away, and everything was fine with his butter. It was his sacrifice for what he did for meditation, and it was his ordeal. Well, he started to become a, he was so revered for his piety and, and, uh, and other things that other people started to join in with him. So he has now all these people that are following after him, and one day this man dies. And he has all these people that have done this with him, and they have, uh, they have, put their butter out, and they have, they have done their meditation. And because this man would have his problem with his butter, it seemed to be the fact that every single person that followed him needed to have a cat because he tied his cat to the bedpost. So every man that followed in his, in his footsteps, they went out and bought a cat. Little did they know that the reason that his cat was tied to the bedpost had nothing to do with tradition. It just had to do with the fact that he didn't want his cat eating his butter. But every single person that followed after him thought it was the tradition to go and buy a cat, have it tied to the bedpost. That's a tradition. That's a tradition. How many of you know the... um, how many, okay, this would be good. The pill bottles that come in the store, the, you know, you get aspirin or, or anything like that. How many of you know that white cotton junk that's in the top of all those bottles, okay? Bayer Corporation, you ready for this? According to a 1999 article, Bayer Corporation said they stopped putting the annoying, this was their words, the annoying clump of white cotton in their aspirin bottles. They interviewed their vice president of operations, and this is what he said. We concluded that there really wasn't any reason to keep the cotton except tradition, except tradition. 
it really added no value to the, the aspirin itself. It really didn't preserve it any longer. It really did, it had no use other than that's just what has happened for years upon years upon years upon years. This morning, we're going to look at a man by the name of Josiah, and he was eight years old when he began to reign. Some of your kids just went outside, and they're eight years old. He was eight years old when he began to reign, but the Bible says about Josiah that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You know what I want to be said about my life? I posted on Facebook this week these words. If God were to write a book of the Bible or write a chapter of the Bible or even a verse of the Bible about me, would he be able to say, Johnny did that which was right in the sight of the Lord? You know what I want to be said about me? I want one day to be said about me that Johnny did that which was right in the sight of the Lord because we're going to see that there's people here in this book of 2 Kings that did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. But he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And we're going to have to take our look at our life this morning according to 2 Kings chapter 22 and Josiah's life. And are we doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord? I want you to look at verse number 2 of 2 Kings chapter 22 here. And if you have a pen, I encourage you to underline these words. The, ver the first part of verse 2, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. My first point this morning is Josiah's desire. Josiah's desire was to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You may think, okay, Johnny, well, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's great. That's awesome. But I want you to catch the prerequisites of this. Because, yes, we see Josiah, if we just start in 2 Kings chapter 22, we see Josiah and how, okay, he was eight years old. He was brought up in the ways of the Lord. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But I want you to catch something. Because if we just start here in 22, that's all we see. I want you to go back a couple of verses. In, ch in chapter 21, the Bible says in verse number 19, Ammon was 20 and 2 years old when he began to reign. This is Josiah's dad. You ready? This is Josiah's dad. He was 20 and 2 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, oh, help me, Meshulameth, the daughter of Heruz of Joth Jothba. And this is what it says about Ammon. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Josiah is eight years old, and the Bible says about his reign that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But his dad, Ammon, he grew up in a household that was evil. He grew up in a house that, grew, that did not talk about the Lord. He grew up in a house that did not go to church. He grew up in a house of the Lord that put up idols in the house of the Lord. That's the kind of house that Josiah grew up in. That's the kind of place that he had. And his father, Ammon, was a wicked, wicked man. And Josiah is, as a young age, is growing up in a house where his father is promoting all of this wickedness and all of this evil in Josiah's house and in the kingdom which with Josiah lived. But I want you to notice in verse number 20 and 21, at the end of verse 20, he said that, and Ammon did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh did. Some of you recognize that name. That was one of the most evil kings that was ever king. Manasseh. King Manasseh was Ammon's father, which now is Josiah's grandfather. Josiah's grandfather is doing wicked in the sight of the Lord. Did some evil things. Tore down the house of the Lord. Put up idols all over the place. And Ammon, his son, then follows in his footsteps. And now we have Josiah in chapter number 22, and the Bible says about Josiah, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Break the mold. It, was, it would be so easy for Josiah to just say, you know what, my grandfather did it, my father did it. it, what's so wrong with me to just go and follow in their footsteps? It would be so hard to tear everything down that they've built. It would be so hard to start rebuilding the temple of God. It would be so hard to start teaching these people and leading these people in a new direction. Let's just continue on in the way they're going. Let's just continue on in the evil that's going on. It would have been so easy. But Josiah, the Bible says in verse number two, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now you say, well, he's going to pay for some of the things that his father did. 
I want to look at Ezekiel chapter 18 real quick. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read this. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 14. The Bible says, Now lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sin, which he hath done. Sound familiar? Seeth all the sins that his father hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like. I want you to catch down to verse number 19. Yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? This is Ezekiel 18, 19. When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. You say, well, well Johnny, he's going to pay for some of the things that his father did. According to the Bible, according to God's word, Josiah is his own man. And according to Ezekiel chapter 18, I think what the writer is trying to get across is you will account for the deeds of your own self, your own life. You and I will stand before God and I will not give an account for what Mr. Kelly has done. I will not give an account for what Mr. McGee has done. I will not give an account for what Mr. Cronin has done. I will give an account for John Boucher IV. I will give an account for what I have done in my life, for the things that I've done wrong, for the good things that I have done. I will be rewarded for the things that I've done. I will be be judged for the things that I have not done that are right. But I will not stand before God and take something from somebody else. Each person is responsible for their own self. And you say, well, Johnny, it's his dad, though. It's his dad, Ezekiel 18 The Bible says, the soul that sinneth it shall die, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him. You can say, well, Johnny, you know what? I've messed up. I have. My life is mostly behind me. I have messed up, and maybe if God were to write about me right now and he were to say, put your name in the blank, has done that which was blank in the sight of the Lord. You say, Johnny, I think, honestly, if I look at my life and I'm honest, I don't think, I don't think that God would say that I did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. I honestly would like to say, you can change. It can change. Because you say, well, no, it can't. I'm already already through most of my life. The majority of my life is behind me. Paul, Saul, Paul, Paul was on his way to Damascus, he had tortured, he had killed, he had made fun of, he had completely destroyed a lot of Christianity, and Paul is no young boy at this point, he's an adult, he's grown up, and he's on his way to Damascus, and he meets the Lord, and I can tell you something, when you meet the Lord, and you see him for who he really is, changes. It changes your life. It changes your being. It changes who you are because God, knowing God and knowing him for who he really is, you can't stay the same. You can't be the same person. You can't do the same things. You see someone that is just newly saved, and they got it. I mean, they got it. They're saved. There's just a glow. There's a glow about them. And I love it because they just want to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. They want to do that which, which pleases God. You say, well, I've messed up. My life is mostly behind me. And I, I know that maybe I haven't done which was right in the sight of the Lord. But you know what? If Paul can change persecuting Christians, killing Christians, listen, you and I today, we can change. Where is Josiah's desire? His desire is not of his father. It's not of his grandfather. His desire is in the word of the Lord. His desire was in God himself. And we don't need anything else except for God. Except for God's word. You know what he gives us? He gives us hope. He gives us peace. He gives us comfort. That's what God gives us. In this case, it happened to be fathers and grandfathers, basically family for Josiah that he had to break the mold from. Josiah's desire had to be, the mold had to be broken from his father and his grandfather, basically family. Maybe in your case, it's not family. Maybe you see friends, acquaintances, 
that are leading you in a path that you know is not right. And maybe taking you in a direction that you say, man, this is not where I need to be going. Josiah had to break the mold from from that family, from where they were going. And maybe this morning, it's not family. Maybe it's people that you are closely associated with that you say, they may be taking me in the wrong direction. Where's your desire this morning? Josiah's desire was to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Because guess what? When the Bible now has been written and it's been written about King Josiah, the Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Imagine how easy it would have been to just continue on, to continue on, to continue on. Then it would have just been like his father and his grandfather did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, led Israel in a wrong direction. Break the mold this morning. Let's be different. Let's do something a little bit different. Let's have a desire to please the Lord, to do that which is right in the, in the sight of the Lord. But number two, I want you to look down at verse number eight. Josiah's desire was to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But I want you to catch something because Josiah realizing what his father had done and his grandfather had done, they destroyed the t- <coughs> they destroyed the house of the Lord. They took it all down. They put up all the idols. And when Josiah comes in, he tells Shaphan is, is his name. He tells him, he says, I want you to go to the house of the Lord. And I want you to go to the person that's there. And I want you to take all the money that has been given to the house of the Lord. <clears throat> and I want you to give it to those people that have been rebuilding it. And I want them, the masons and the bricklayers and everything that's going on, I want them to be paid to be able to take care of the house of the Lord. That's what I want to happen. And so Josiah sends Shaphan over there to Hilkiah, which is the high priest. Notice what happens in the high priest. Verse number 8, this is what the Bible says. Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king the word again. I want you to notice the first thing that Shaphan does. He brings the word of God to somebody. Brings the word of God to somebody. When you get saved, when something happens in your life and God comes in and makes a total difference, you want to bring it to people. You want to give it to people. You want other people to know. And Shaphan, the first thing he did was he brought it to the king. And he brings it to the king here uh, and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it to the land of them that, that do the work. They have oversight of the house of the Lord. Then he says in verse 10, But, um, we found something in verse 10. He says, Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has, ha, priest has delivered me a book. And he read it before the king. So he says, he says, hey, we gave the money to all the workers. They're working on rebuilding the house. This is what's going on. But um, we found this book. We found this book. It's the book of the Lord. And he starts to read it for the king. Second point is this. Josiah's discovery. He had a desire to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but then he discovers the book of the Lord, the law of the Lord. So this book has been stored away, has been put away for years upon years upon years. Manasseh, then Ammon. Now Josiah, who's reigning in his stead, finds this book that's been put away for years. And the Hilkiah, the priest, says, hey, take this to the king. And so Shaphan takes it to him, and he says, hey, we found this book. I want you to notice in verse 11 what happens. Watch this. He says in verse 11, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law. What did he do? He rent his clothes. You know what this book? This book is a convicting book. Josiah, the first thing that happened is he rent his clothes. Wednesday night, I'm going to pick on Mr. Dean for a second. Wednesday night, we were in youth group, and I'm getting ready to start a 13-week series on something, so I wanted to take a little bit of a break, and I asked Mr. Dean if he would share something, share the challenge on Wednesday night, and he said he would. And Mr. Dean got up there, and he started sharing uh, from Proverbs chapter 8, which was the proverb of Wednesday, 
And he started sharing about Proverbs chapter 8. And as he was sharing this with the teens, he said, hey, guys, guess what? If you don't get anything out of this today, that's okay. This, this, these are his words. If you don't get anything out of this today, that's okay. I'm sharing this because it helped me. I'm sharing this because when I read, this is what he says. When I read it, this is what he said, hit me square in the face. Proverbs chapter 8 is talking about warnings and wisdom that crieth in the street and on the high tops and all the places. And he says, hey, look, there's been times where I've been given a warning and I've gone right through it and I haven't obeyed. And he says, I don't care if you get anything out of this today, but I'm preaching this for me because when he read God's word, it convicted him. When you read God's word with an open heart, with an open mind, it will convict you. It convicts me. It convicts Christians. It convicts people. The first thing that Josiah did, he just had to rent his clothes because he knew what had been going on had been wrong. What had been going on all around him was not what God wanted to happen. And when he read, when he heard God's word opened and it was read to him, he said, oh man, we have done that which is wrong. We have not followed in God's way and what God wanted. We're doing that, which is wrong. A well-known golfer went golfing one day with the president, which at the time happened to be Gerald Ford, and he went with Jack Nicholas and Billy Graham. Interesting crew. President Gerald Ford, Jack Nicholas, Billy Graham, and then this other man. And they go golfing. And when they got back, that that man that is not named comes out of the group and one of his friends is there. And he said, how was it golfing with the president and Billy Graham? How was it? And this is what the man said. Man, I just don't need Billy Graham stuffing all that religion down my throat. Those are his words. And he stormed away, got really mad, stormed away, walks away. The man that asked him, he's like, I'm not going to let this go. I want to figure out what Billy Graham said. I want to know what happened. So he follows him out. He follows him. He said, hey, was Billy Graham a little rough on you today? And the man replied with this. No, he didn't even mention religion. You know what happened with that golfer? He was convicted just being around a man of God. When we get around this book and we take it for what it really is, it's convicting. Listen, we can't just read this book and come away with an open mind and come away not changed because God's word will change you. God's word will convict of sin. It'll convict of things where we've been wrong. It'll convict because the Bible says this. Romans 3.23, all have there's not a person in this room this morning that has not sinned. There's not a person in this room this morning that can say they've not done one thing wrong. And you know what? If I read the entire Bible, and this isn't possible, if I read the entire Bible and did not get convicted of one thing, and I read Romans 3.23, I'd be convicted. Because guess what? I did stuff wrong. I've done things that I know are wrong. I've sinned. But the Bible is a convicting book because it shows us where we're wrong. It shows us, you know what the Bible says about it, Hebrews 12, 9. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And you know what? God's word is a discerner of what's inside. It knows. It can convict of what's, of what's wrong, of what's right. It knows. But it's not just a convicting book. I want you to look at verse 15. Th they bring this book after he has just noticed that everything is wrong. They bring the book to uh, the, the, uh, what, what, it's the uh, prophetess. And in verse 15, it says, And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me. Basically, tell Josiah the king, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. 
Bible is not just a convicting book, it's a condemning book. It's a condemning book. Here's, here's, what, I'm, here's what I mean. Romans 6.23, for the wages of what was in Romans 3.23, it was all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. That's Bible. That's not John Boucher. That's not Calvary Baptist Church. That's what God's word said. And for our sin, which all of us have, Romans 3.23, for our, all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, the wages, what we deserve for our sin is death. It's a condemning book. There will be a day. I just wrote my eschatology doctrinal statement. You talk about, like, hard the end times is like crazy. And I'm writing my, doc, my end times doctrinal statement. And we're, we're, you know, looking at the rapture. Then we're looking at the tribulation, the second coming of Christ. Then a thousand year millennial reign. I mean, there's a lot that's going to happen on this earth. But one thing that will happen and is for sure is that if one person dies without Jesus Christ, they will spend eternity in a lake of fire. That's what will happen. There's no, there's no running away from that. There's no trying to escape that. There's no trying to leave that. It is what it is, and that's what the Bible teaches. The wages of sin is death. What is death? Separation from God forever. We cannot be, God cannot be in the presence of sin. And until we come before God and say, God, I've sinned. I've failed you. I have not done which was right in the sight of the Lord. I have failed you. Would you forgive me? And until we can come before God and say, I've failed, would you forgive me? Come into my life and save me from that. Until that happens, we're destined for what's called the lake of fire. And you know what is sad is the discovery showed Josiah that it was a convicting book. He had to rent his clothes. He rent his clothes because he was so convicted. But then he showed he was showed that it's a condemning book. That if you don't accept Jesus Christ, the only way, he, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father. Where's the Father? He's in heaven. No man comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the convicting, the condemning. But lastly, I want you to notice this. Verse 19, this is so awesome. Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. And then I shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king the word again. I want you to notice something. It's not just a convicting book. It's not just a condemning book. We are not just convicted and condemned. It's a comforting book. Oh, how awesome is this? Because I only read half the verse. For the wages of sin is death. Yes, we deserve for our sin. We deserve death and hell. But you know what? That awesome conjunction, but. It's a three-letter word, but it changes all the world. But. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I sat with two teenagers two weeks ago, and I said, if I had a gift right here, I, I actually took the keys to my car out. <laughs> they like that. And I said, if I were to give you my key, I said, this is a gift to you. It's yours. What would it have to be to be yours? And the one boy kind of looked at it, and he thought... He had no idea what to answer. He thought it was a trick question. He says, it's not a trick question. I said, if I told you this is yours, what do you have to do to make this key to this car yours? He said, I got to take it. I got to take it. The comforting words of the book of the Bible is this. God has given eternal life. You know what's awesome? Romans 10, 13. Whosoever, that's everybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And you can know where you're going to spend eternity when you die. It's a convicting book. It's so convicting because sin will take you to a place called hell. That's the condemnation. But then the comforting part of it, you can spend eternity in a place called heaven. That's so comforting to me because when I pass from this earth, my, my assistant basketball coach from my freshman year just yesterday passed away. I, got the, I saw the thing on Facebook, and it, 
He passed away. And I told my wife, I said, you know, it's sad because he was a great influence on my life. And he passed away. But, you know, I know where my friend is. I know where my assistant coach is right now. I know where he is because, you know what? When he was there at that school, he lived a life that probably was not pleasing to the Lord at first. But he came to that school and got some things changed. He became assistant basketball coach and helped out for a long while, and he was a help and a blessing to me. And now, as he's passed on, I know where he's going to spend eternity because he's accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. But then lastly, I want you to notice this. We've seen his desire. We've seen the discovery. But lastly, and real quick, I want you to notice his decision. His decision. Look at chapter 23, verse number 3. The Bible says, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant. There's the decision. Before the Lord to walk after the Lord. And to keep his commandments and his testimonies and all his statutes with all their heart and their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. You know what his covenant was? You know what his decision was? I'm going to follow the Lord. The reason verse number two of chapter 22 was able to be written, Josiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, was because he made a covenant in chapter 23 that said, I'm going to walk after the Lord. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. He literally made a covenant and said, God, what you want me to do, I'll do. Where you want me to go, I'll go. What you want me to say, I'll say. I'll do it, God. I'm making a covenant with you. I'll do it. You ever made a covenant? With the Lord, you ever told him you're going to do something? When I was in college, there were certain words that we we had a very, Pastor Sexton, Clarence Sexton was a very wise man. And he has a lot of, like, phrases that he'll use. Here's a couple, here was two of them. If you're going to make a decision in your life, make it personal. Here's what I mean by that, because nothing is real until it's personal. Nothing is real until it's personal. That was one thing that was just drilled into me at college. You want to make a decision for the Lord? Make it personal. Make it real in your life by making it personal. But then let's make it dynamic. You want to know how to make it dynamic? Nothing's dynamic unless it's specific. So make it real by making it personal, but make it dynamic. Make it a covenant for the Lord by making it specific. Don't just make a... Before, before I heard these, this is, one of the, this is one of the things he said. You come up to the altar, you make a decision for the Lord, but you may, it, it, sometimes you just make, we make it so broad. God, I want to do right. God, help me to live for you. Get specific with it. Nothing's dynamic unless it's specific. God, help me to stay away from this. Help me to do this. Help me to wake up at this time to read my Bible. God, help me to do this at work. Let's make things specific. Let's get real with it because nothing is real until it's personal. Nothing's dynamic unless it's specific. So Josiah, he made the decision to follow. He said, I'm going to walk after. But then I want you to notice, he didn't just make the decision to follow. He made the decision to fulfill. Here's what happens a lot of times. I, I see it because we go to camps with teens all the time. This is what happens. We make the decisions at camp. We make the decisions at church. We make the decisions to do that, which is right. We make the decision. We come up. We cry with somebody. We make a decision to do what's right before the Lord. But we don't fulfill it. We get outside this building. The emotion leaves. And we feel like, well, nobody's here with me. And I can't really fulfill this on my own. So it's done. It's over with. Josiah did that which was right in the Lord. Because not only did he make a decision, he fulfilled it. And you and I this morning, we are not going to be what the Lord wants us to be until we can fulfill the decisions that God has given to us to follow. You want to be able to be a person that is, if it's written about you in the Bible, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord? I do. But when I make a decision, I want to follow it and I want to fulfill it. I want to fulfill it. I end with this story. The Greeks... 
they had an interesting game in their Olympic Games. And the winner of the race was not the runner that finished first, as we like to think. The winner was the person that finished with their torch still lit. Still lit. And you can, we, these guys, they'd be running through their race, and they'd get to the point where they were going too fast, maybe it would blow out. I want to end it with this. Don't let the torch go out of your Christian life. Stay lit, stay with your torch lit for the Lord because you can finish first all you want. You can get to the finish line and look at people behind you, but your torch isn't lit. You've burned out for the Lord. You may have burned your torch out. You may have done something and you got so bogged down that you forgot the Lord way back. But get to the finish line. End the course for the Lord Jesus Christ with your torch still lit. Because unless your torch is lit for the Lord, it means nothing. Your Christian life needs to have the Lord in it. And until we can get to the point where God is everything in our life, and we've walked the life, we've walked our Christian life, and God is the center of it. He's everything. And we're walking, and our torch is lit for Him. If your torch wasn't lit, there's no point in running the race. Those guys would be out of the race if their torch wasn't lit. Run the race for the Lord, but keep your torch lit. Here's where I'm at this morning. I'm going to pray right here. Because I don't want to get so bogged down with everything that's going around, with things that are going on, with activities and this and that, that I lose my torch for the Lord. Hey, let's do this this morning. Calvary Baptist Church, let's keep our torches lit. Let's keep going for Jesus Christ. Let's keep it lit so that we, when we get to the end, we can say, hey, look, we've kept our torch lit. Look at all this. God has helped us to do all this. And we can do it if our torch is lit for him. Father, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for King Josiah. I thank you for the story of his life. Thank you for what he stood for. And God, may it be said about my life that John Boucher did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. May it be said of every single person in this room that they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Would you help us? God, may we not get so bogged down. May we not get so burdened with things that are going on around us, but may we keep our torch lit. Thank you for keeping us in the race. God, even though we fail you, even though we mess up, and even though we're not perfect, thank you for, for never, ever leaving nor forsaking us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just have two questions this morning. Maybe someone was here this morning and I was talking about the conviction of the book, the condemning of the book, and the comforting of the book. And maybe you said, you know, I've never gotten to the comforting part. I don't know if I were to die right now, God forbid, but I don't know if I were to die right now where I would spend eternity. But I want to know that that place is heaven. I want to know that when I pass from this earth, I want to know that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. Because let me just tell you, the alternative is not as nice. 